Today, the topic of our conversation is ibutamarin, or MK677, or LUM201, which many people consider a peptide, or a SARM, or a stay-home-and-eat-chips-on-the-sofa-all-day cheat code. However, it is not truly any of those things. It's a non-peptide that was synthetically created in the mid-1990s. But because it acts similar to many of the peptides we've discussed on this channel, it's worth a discussion, especially since many people like it due to the fact that it's orally available, i.e. you can take it as a pill. Not to mention, it's a subscriber-requested video, and I'm certainly flattered to discuss the topic and hope I can provide the info you're seeking. If you do have any video requests, feel free to leave them in the comment section below, in addition addition to a friendly like and subscribe. Last time I talked about Ibutamarin, I was below 100 subs, and now that we're pushing 1100, I think it's worth discussing again. And once we get to 5000, we'll do a third times a charm video. I'm kidding, maybe. That said, as always, this is not medical advice. For any particular questions or concerns about a compound you may take, please consult your medical provider. This is purely meant to be educational. So where should we start? Ibutamarin is a ghrelin mimetic that, like other peptides we've talked about, agonizes the ghrelin GH secretagogue receptor. Although the compound was initially developed in about 1995, it's being produced by a pharmaceutical company called Lumos Pharma under the name Orotrope and has been evaluated in different contexts, predominantly with regards to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and growth hormone deficiency. Before we get started, let's do a quick refresher on how the GH secretagogue pathway works. So, as we know by now, growth hormone releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus prompting growth hormone release from the anterior pituitary, downstream release of IGF-1 from the liver, and so on and so forth, all of the actions that we know and love about IGF-1. Ghrelin is a hormone secreted in the stomach known as the hunger hormone. That said, a lot of these compounds bind to this ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor that further encourages release of growth hormone from the pituitary. So ibutamarin is a popular one. Similar to other G HRPs, it's been looked at as a possible treatment for growth hormone deficient children, and some data even evaluated its role in sarcopenia, a natural loss of muscle as we age. That's why most of the data you'll see are either in elderly people who are healthy, or with musculoskeletal injuries, or dementia, or healthier young adults. And interestingly, it's been evaluated in humans much more than many of the other compounds we've talked about here. That said, I know people prefer when I keep it short and sweet, so I'll try my best. One of the more recent studies in 2008, despite it being a lower sample size study, was longitudinal and followed healthy elderly subjects for about two years. It's pretty interesting because they gave MK677 to these folks and took a look at what many of us care about, as in what did it do to growth hormone, IGF-1, body mass, strength, and it has shown increases in both growth hormone and IGF-1 while exhibiting increased fat-free mass purportedly due to increased intracellular water. However, at the same time, it didn't affect abdominal visceral fat or strength. And those studies showed that the participants after two years of use actually had decreased LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, which is popularly known as bad cholesterol. At the same time, it showed that, like other GHRPs, it may play a role in increasing insulin resistance as displayed by increased blood glucose and HbA1c. The purpose of the study was to evaluate its role in preventing and reversing frailty in the elderly, and the results certainly highlight the importance of further investigation into the subject given its apparent promise. Other interesting findings in human data are anti-catabolic, effects via reversal of nitrogen wasting, an ability to enhance bone turnover, and aid in treatment of elderly patients recovering from hip fractures, as visualized by more effective stair climbing power and the speed at which these subjects walk. There were other performance metrics that showed no improvement with ibutamarin administration. However, hip fractures in the elderly are debilitating processes with significant morbidity and mortality. It's also shown that it can help quite a few people with sleep. It's shown an ability to help prolong sleep time and REM sleep while decreasing REM latency or the time it takes to achieve REM sleep. And since REM is crucial for memory consolidation, it got me fascinated. Some of the risks that we kind of already touched on are pretty consistent increase in insulin resistance as demonstrated by higher fasting blood sugars and elevated HbA1c, which is essentially clinically a three-month measurement of average blood sugars. Additionally, we always worry about the possibility of increasing cancer risk when taking peptides that encourage GH secretion, 
IGF-1, and just generalized growth. However, no long-term data has evaluated that concern with regards to ibutamarin use. If you do choose to use it or know someone considering it, these are certainly metrics to monitor and things to consider, whether it's basic blood work beforehand, throughout your cycle, and even after. Other things to keep an eye on are fluid retention and voracious hunger, which makes sense considering you're agonizing this ghrelin receptor as ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone. It's an appetite stimulant. Additionally, and somewhat importantly, and I'll be candid here, I'm having a bit of trouble finding a precise half-life measurement, and it hasn't truly been evaluated in humans. I'm seeing numbers ranging from four to six hours up to approximately a day. I personally have a tendency to lean towards the former, but it's up for interpretation and I think I would personally appreciate some more data outlining that precise measurement because at the end of the day, it is important. Now to wrap up the video, I'm going to touch on a question I got, and that is, is ibutamarin in conjunction with CJC1295 with DAC, DAC, a good idea or a waste of time? If you don't know the difference between DAC and no DAC, i.e. the presence of a drug affinity complex, check out my most recent video as we get into details about the differences between between those compounds and CJC1295, so I won't belabor the point here. And this may not be the answer you're seeking, but I'm a play it safe type of guy if you haven't figured that out by now. As MK677 has been relatively well studied and generally well tolerated, and it's shown efficacy in targeting these endpoint goals of growth hormone that many of us are seeking, I personally, if I were to use it, would just stick to MK677 alone. We don't precisely know its half-life, but we do know it produces increases in growth hormone hormone, IGF-1, may assist with sleep, and retention of lean body mass. I wouldn't see the need in adding a GHRH or growth hormone releasing hormone agonist on top of that. That said, I know many people do it. However, I especially err on the side of caution because yes, there are a lot of growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone secretagog combos out there, but I personally feel like it's overkill or I don't have enough data in my disposal that says it's not. Sure, you may get a transient, larger, initial bump in IGF-1, but we don't know the long-term feedback on the pituitary and the hypothalamus. On top of that, it may even amplify the risks we discussed here. Those are just my thoughts. Take them as you will. I hope you found this video helpful, educational, and maybe, maybe just maybe, a slight bit entertaining. That said, thank you all for watching. I'm working on some smaller videos and some longer ones that'll be released soon. But before you go, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe here at the channel. Thank you. Have a great day.